Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining our OncLive webinar, The State of Ovarian Cancer, Surgical Approaches and Management. This week, our topics for discussion will focus on surgical approaches and management, updates on institutional practices, neoadjuvant therapy to delay surg surgery, surgical techniques, laparoscopy, surgical devices. We'll also talk about interval debulking, secondary, primary and secondary. Uh, during this webinar, we do encourage the submission of questions, which, we, which will be addressed by our faculty in the Q&A portion. So we do have a lot to cover. So without further delay, let's get started and have our uh, faculty introduce themselves. So we'll start off with Dr. Herzog. Hi, greetings from Cincinnati uh, this evening. I'm Dr. Tom Herzog. I'm Deputy Director of the University of Cincinnati Cancer Center, and it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you. Great, thanks to have you here. And Dr. Monk? Yeah, greetings, Brad Monk from Arizona. I don't know why my title's so long in that slide, but I'm happy <laughs> to be here. I, I live in Arizona, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you're, supposed to, you're not supposed to put your rap sheet, you're supposed to put your accomplishments. <laughs> we have everything you ever did on there. I'm in yeah. Dr. Brown. <laughs> Hi everybody, Kindergarten. these are hard acts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jubilee Brown. I'm a professor of G1 oncology at Levine Cancer Institute Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. Great, thank you. So I'll just um, hand it over to Dr. Brown and she's gonna go over some of the first points of discussion and then we'll proceed through the program. Great, so much. Um, you know, what we'll cover here today is really about the surgical management of ovarian cancer. Unfortunately, my slides have uh, changed a little bit. We were going to talk. Um, we were going to talk first about how ovarian cancer has changed. How ovarian cancer care has changed. And this keeps moving. There's a little bit of a delay. So, so let's send the Tom first, and let's talk for a second about how your practice has changed in terms of how you treat your patients with ovarian cancer. Are you, Tom, are you doing more telemedicine? Are you seeing um, how people want to be treated for ovarian cancer? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, obviously for pelvic masses, for example, people have a totally different attitude uh, towards having surgery and, and whatnot, especially during what was anticipated to be the peak surge. Uh, so we, A, we weren't necessarily allowed to do those cases unless it looked very much like a cancer um, and we were uh, um, pretty sure it was we had to get get on the phone and argue um, with our cancer patients though uh, where there's been a biopsy or ascites or you know it's, it's very clear on imaging um, most of those patients that I've encountered anyway uh, were anxious to get going with uh, some form of treatment now uh, we'll get into the choices that one has to make uh, with that first presentation in frontline therapy, uh, but uh, most of my patients anyway in Cincinnati were anxious to get going. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Tom. Well, so with COVID, SGO has made uh, some substantial modifications for how we um, treat ovarian cancer. Uh, we recognize in the SGO guidelines that neoadjuvant chemotherapy may be effective in delaying surgery and inpatient hospitalizations, and that's really a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, some of the other things that we'll touch on now and also in the next uh, webinar next week are regarding maintenance therapy and even the use of growth factor support, how we treat uh, patients uh, with ovarian cancer in this setting. But have you noticed a change in your practice? Yeah, I think every region is a little different, right? We have uh, taken the virus very seriously, um, but we've tried not to hurt the patients that don't have the virus. And so, you know, we take our temperatures, uh, surgeries are, are, are tested before the operation is done. We all wear masks, we social distance, um, but we've really tried to do business as usual. So. Very few of us have delayed any of our operations. I mean, the last thing you want to do is hurt a woman with ovarian cancer. So if she was a candidate for primary debulking, we found a way to do it. Um, 
Same thing, putting an IUD in for a, a low-grade endometrial cancer. You know, we, we just didn't feel good about that. And not knowing when it would end, so we tried to be respectful, take it seriously, but let's not inadvertently sort of have an impact on, on, on other patients. So we've tried, because it's all about the net, right? It's all about the net. So preventing from getting the virus, but also preventing, preventing individuals from being affected by the uh, uh, pandemic in general. The hysteria almost, if you, could, if, you, if you will, although I don't mean to sensationalize it. Well, thanks for insights. So with that, let's turn to Dr. Herzog who's going to talk with us about neoadjuvant approaches. Okay. Jubilee, thank you so much. Uh, so I think one of the big things that we want to discuss tonight in, in the context of how COVID-19 has affected ovarian cancer is really what's that decision process when a patient presents to you in your office for that first visit? And um, we have to make some decisions pretty quickly. So someone that has classic signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer, uh, we do want to get a diagnosis as soon as possible. So to say, well, um, you know, we're, we're just going to delay this for three or four weeks and, and see if we're in a better spot is, is really not a very good option. The patient's anxious. They're often highly symptomatic, which is what's really driven them finally to diagnosis is because they, they now have ascites, they have uh, abdominal distension, so they're having usually some pain and discomfort. They're having uh, some shortness of breath, which can, of course, be confused with uh, uh, COVID symptoms. And, and of course, the, it causes major GI issues as well. So this is looking at uh, when the patient comes in, and, and we're, we have to make that decision. Now, traditionally, what we've done um, is really, I would say, uh, prior to 2010, I think most people's bias, at least in the United States, was really to move to getting the patient to the operating room and doing a maximal cytoreduction at that point in time. We then shifted those patients over to um, chemotherapy. We usually did uh, at least six cycles of combination carbo or platinum-based chemotherapy. And... Um, we tried to get those patients to a complete resection as often as we could. Uh, we felt pretty good uh, about getting them down less than one centimeter. For those of us that are old enough to remember, optimal at one point was even less than two centimeters. So uh, things have changed over time. Now, if we, if we look at um, sort of the new paradigm, if you will, um, we always had those patients that were too sick that we said, well, why don't we give them some chemo get rid of the acidic fluid, get their volume of tumor down, make it so that they may not have to have such an aggressive surgery, and see if they don't have at least a decent outcome with that. And uh, some of our colleagues in Europe were bigger fans of this than, than some of the thought leaders here. Um, and, and so a number of trials were developed in the early to mid-2000s that then reported um, and, and we'll talk about that. So the idea was, uh, can you increase the ability to get these patients down to no gross residual? Can you decrease morbidity and mortality? And the real important question is, can you at least preserve overall survival? And perhaps you could improve it. And that's what these studies went about doing. This is a slide um, that, as you can see, has uh, significant omental caking. Uh, you see a contraction of the bowel and the mesentery and, and the omentum there. And this is where you don't want to be in a primary site of reduction if you're trying to get to R0. Um, assume this is going on throughout the entire abdominal and pelvic cavity. So, yes, you, you could probably spend eight or nine hours with, with uh, uh, a laser uh, uh, or some type of device to try to take out all the miliary disease. But the fact is, the chances of getting every single spot of cancer out is, is nearly impossible. Um, you're not going to be able to do five bowel resections, a full liver resection, strip the diaphragm, all the peritoneum, because there'd still be disease at the root of the mesentery. And that's really the issue that we deal with in, in many of these cases. So what... You know, what's the impact of optimal cytoreduction? And this is data um, that, that we saw from Dr. Dubois 
who really, I think, did a nice job of illustrating, uh, you know, which survival curve you'd want to be on. And I, I, don't, I don't know if that's showing up for you, but on the ordinate there is, is uh, survival. Um, and then we have months there that you can see. So um, obviously you want to get these patients down to no gross residual. There is a huge difference in terms of the outcomes that you see. And we have a number of databases here that have done that. Dr. Hoskins has done similar type data analysis here in, in the United States for Memorial Sloan Kettering. And so there's a number of, of different ways of, of looking at this, but the key is to try to get all that disease out as fast as you can. So I, I spoke to you earlier about the fact that you, we had a number of trials that, that have reported, and this was the first trial, and this reported in 2010. Um, and this was by Dr. Vergoat. And this is the EROTC trial that took advanced stage patients, randomized them to maximum cytoreduction up front or primary chemotherapy followed by platinum based therapy. And uh, um, you can see the design there. If they had progression of disease, they were removed from the protocol. So here's what, you know, in terms of looking at these endpoints, here's, here's where you are. So if you look at primary cytoreduction, there was no residual um, in 20% of the patients. Now, you might argue that that's not very good compared to what we do in the United States in many centers, and I would agree with that. Um, nonetheless, these were patients that had large volume disease. One of the requirements, or I think the average disease in this was uh, 10 centimeter uh, was the target lesion, if you will, if you were looking at the largest mass. Uh, and you can see you increase that uh, probably even below what we see in the United States, the 52% with no residual. And you can see your suboptimal rates, of course, are inverted uh, related to that. And you can see the overall survival if they had primary debulking um, versus uh, neoadjuvant. And, and so there was a new numerical uh, benefit for the residual group, for the no residual group. But overall, there was really no significant difference. And we'll look at the survival curves here. As you can see, um, they lay right on top of one another for the entire intent to treat population. So as you look at the PFS versus the OS there, uh, I don't know if you've seen curves any closer than that, Point, 0 0.99, 0 0.98. Um, so pretty impressive in terms of, of that. But if you're a skeptic, again, you're going to look at those overall survival numbers in, in terms of the medians and say we do much better than that. Um, with our stage three, four patients in our institution, and we'll get back to that. Second trial came in, that's, so that was 2010. This is 2013 now, and this was the CORUS trial. Uh, again, looking at the same uh, design um, and, and, and taking patients and randomizing them to primary surgery versus neoadjuvant with interval uh, debulking. This is looking at the mortality, and we saw similar data, and I'll have, a, I think, some summary uh, graphs here that will put this all together, so I'll go through it quickly. But you can see that you significantly reduce the amount of death within 28 days. Um, so you might argue, well, in my institution, it's not that high, okay? Uh, but this is a large data set, large trial, um, so keep that in mind. We then had the um, JCOG trial uh, by ONDA uh, that looked at similar um, uh, approach, again, looking at maximal cytoreduction uh, versus uh, starting with chemotherapy and advanced stage ovarian cancer. These were stage 3C and 4 ovarian cancer patients. And you, here I wanted to compare what you see in terms of getting these patients down to less than one centimeter. So we, we, we believe, and, and I know that the Bois curves I showed you at the beginning um, show that the that the patients that still had any gross residual, even if it was less than one centimeter, were not very separated. There are other data sets that show that curve lies more in the middle between the two, and the truth probably lies somewhere between those studies. But the point is that it's, it's probably better to get the patient down to less than one centimeter than greater than one centimeter, but you, you, the, the, the true goal is to get these patients down to R0, no gross residual. But here we are looking at less than one centimeter, and you can see a significant improvement in, in terms of being able to do that. Now, what about if we look at that, that group that's no gross disease? And it's approximately two to three times the amount in terms of the benefit. So it's a significant gain that you see based on the three studies I've just shown you. 
And, and so we know, or we think, going back to the Dubois study, if we are able to get more patients down to no gross disease, we should be curing more women with uh, ovarian cancer if we use a neoadjuvant approach. But do we? You know, when we look at those survival medians, that, that doesn't seem to be the case. So this is looking at some of the other things to consider. You decrease the risk of colostomy, uh, complications, and the duration of surgery. So those are all good things as well. Um, these are survival analyses. Um, in terms of, of looking at, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the randomized trials. Um, and I, I think, you know, in terms of trying to judge whether you're going to, what maximal surgical effort are you going to need to do? Um, what is the d disease score? Neil Horowitz did some data on that with GOG 182. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can look at this. This is the Scorpion trial. Um, also uh, looking at the same thing um, in, in terms of um, operative mortality, you can see, again, a significant difference. The, here it's reassuring that you're not decreasing the survival, um, but again, the medians uh, are questioned by some of the top centers. So I think that's sort of the debate right now as to where we are, is how do you really look at this in terms of putting it into perspective? So. These are the trial designs, again, looking at the PFS and the overall survival. And again, the overall survival uh, for most of these um, is not all that impressive, uh, especially the first two trials. Uh, but J JCOG and Scorpion, the, the trials looked um, more, con more like contemporary of what we see in major centers that can do upper abdominal uh, removal of disease and are able to do aggressive surgery. So. With that, I, I think I'd um, uh, be happy to talk about what, what Brad, what do you, what's your approach in terms of looking at neoadjuvant versus, and has it changed with, with COVID-19? Has it, has it changed at all, or have you always been more towards neoadjuvant? You might be yep. muted, Brad. Thank you. I liked your slides a lot. That was an excellent presentation. As I was saying, I, I, I've, I've been very fortunate that, that my approach has not changed. Um, I, you have to be right twice, though, with primary debulking. Um, you have to be right, meaning that you can get the tumor out, whatever your definition is. And then you have to be able to get the patient on chemotherapy and right in about three weeks. Because if it becomes five, six, seven weeks, the tumor grows back. And we've seen that from our studies that, you know, the surgeon will say, oh, you know, I got all the tumor out. And then we get a CAT scan before she goes on trial and there's all this tumor there. And of course, the surgeon says, because they always tell the truth, of course, and they say, oh, it grew back. Yeah. So, you know, I, 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 if, if a patient has 10 societies and has a C125 at 2000 and has carcinomatosis, I think it's a pretty simple answer. Jubilee? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Again, I echo great slides and a great talk. I think it's very clear from, from your talk uh, and from, from all of is that those overlap completely. To see a, a big trial uh, that shows any difference or any real advantage to a huge primary debulking and patients have higher morbidity. Uh, as you yeah. very clearly demonstrated. So, yeah. so for there's trials, no, there's no, they all yeah. tell the same thing. Yeah, there's no question we are able to decrease operative mortality, operative morbidity, uh, extended procedures, um, such as you know upper abdominal um, surgery, colostomies, those types of things. Why is it, do we not see, um, and, and I think about this sometimes, even at night when I'm laying in bed, why is it that we don't see that conversion into a survival advantage, actually, because we really haven't seen that. Why is that? Do we not give enough yeah, well, cycles after the surgery? What is it? I think it's, it's hard uh, to get over tumor biology, right? And I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, Let me ask you that a is it. question, Tom. So some of the most passionate, aggressive surgeons are not fans of maintenance therapy. 
it, 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 it's such a disconnect. And, and I'll get into that yeah. when I sort of give the last talk. But if you look at the PFS benefits from frontline maintenance, yeah, it's way more impactful than any operation you could possibly do. Yeah, so it's an I, interesting I think, juxtaposition, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think you have to be, you really have to, to be consistent. So I, I just wrote down here on a piece of paper, in, in, the, in the May 8th, elaborate bevacizumab have approval, okay, just a few days ago, in the HRD positive subset, okay, you got a 20-month improvement in progression-free survival. Yeah. In the primary endpoint, 17 months to 37. So trust me, a big knife is not going to give you, or a bigger knife, or more kusas or lasers or an extra bowel resection is not going to get you that extra 20 months at that same consistency with no decrement in quality of life. But that, that's but that bowel resection might have a leak, right? Yep. So I, I think I think we just have to be internally consistent and, and honest with ourselves, quite frankly. Right. Oh, that's great. And I think so here I, in the COVID era, yeah. sorry, I, here in the COVID, COVID era, I think all of this has really significant impact on the patient, right? Mm -hmm. Because what we're saying is that there's really not a difference we can see between a big whack primary cytoreduction and neoadjuvant chemotherapy with interval cytoreduction. So it almost really seems like in a COVID era, that should be our standard of care. Yeah. But, but I think great. it's regardless of COVID is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It, it's well, the I right think, thing. Yep. So I do think COVID sh has shined a light on, on this yeah. topic. And that brings us really a beautiful segue to Jubilee's discussion yeah. coming up because what we want to look at are you know, we talk about interval cyto reduction, but do, do we have to do a stem to stern uh, incision and, and still have, can we do this even less, uh, w with less morbidity? Um, and, and, you know, do we have any data on that? Jubilee? Great. Thanks so much. So um, talk now about interval cyto reduction after new adjuvant chemotherapy and what happens and how we can accomplish that. Because at the stage four uh, for outcomes there, um, and I'm just going to reiterate what Tom so nicely showed was that when we look at interval laparotomy after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we actually see a higher rate of optimal status after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and and this is true if you look at the EORTC, the chorus, jet file, and the scorpion trial, no different, but certainly equivalent uh, outcomes in terms of optimal disease status. And then if we look a little bit further, again, let's, let's really hone in the rate because we um, never want to hurt our patients. What we see is a 6 versus a 24% risk of permanent colostomy with, um, with an open primary surgery. Um, and three versus 21% risk of complications that actually require surgery. And that's, that's really very impactful for our patients. So, you know, this brings us to is a question of, can we do minimally invasive surgery for that interval debulking? We have that speak to that. There's one prospective study in 111 patients that looked at patients with ovarian cancer who had a plan for interval debulking. And what we saw there was a reduced rate of unnecessary laparotomy from 30 down to 13%, and in fact, a reduced rate of insufficient exploration from 18 down to no case at all. This was then confirmed in another center. And so what we can take home from that is that it's safe, it's feasible, and predicts optimal side reduction, really. Now, actually, we have been looking at minimally invasive interval debulking. We do have three trials that all show essentially the same thing. So Corrado showed better perioperative outcomes uh, with regard to blood loss, hospital stay, and complications than in laparotomy. And in fact, this author was able to achieve 100% R0 resections with a 15-month need. 26 patients remained without evidence of disease at time of publication. And uh, Giuli Aletti also showed that clinical complete responders had safe and feasible outcomes. 
granted, these are small studies, 30 patients in that study. Um, Favero showed a similar reverence rate it's 20, at 20 months, 80 versus 88%, uh, and uh, did note that there was a non-statistically significant difference in mortality and treatment-free interval. But again, those, were, um, those differences were not statistically significant. So um, next, I'll just sort of do a shout out to my uh, partners. Uh, we studied our outcome and have published this. And what we looked at was minimally invasive surgery compared with laparotomy for an interval debulking. And what we found was that, in fact, it was feasible in our group of MIS versus laparotomy. Um, as you can see, 96% uh, of the MIS group achieved either an R0 or optimal side of reduction um, compared with 83% of the laparotomy group and uh, did not reach statistical significance, but uh, did appear to be uh, certainly equivalent. And as we look a little bit further uh, at our outcomes, we saw that 10% of patients actually had a complete pathologic response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and in terms of minimally invasive surgery that was completed without conversion to a laparotomy, that was 3% of our patients. Um, conversely, of course, that means that 17% were converted to open. We did employ a hand port or a mini lap in almost half, but 36% had laparoscopy only to an optimal um, response. Uh, well, you ch chose patients. You look to see how patients uh, responded to their chemo, and, the, and you, you did minimally invasive surgery for the patients who responded well. Well, that's true, but that's not actually a fault. That just tells us that we appropriately and had uh, good outcomes. What were those outcomes? So our survival for these patients, 27 versus 29 months, uh, not statistically different. And uh, overall survival at the time of publication was really no different at all, 37 versus 35 months. We uh, continued to follow this cohort, and um, one of our awesome residents put our data together, actually, uh, Alice Barr. And so she combined the data with the UNC um, along with an outstanding medical student. Um, uh, Ying Zheng. So they uh, looked at our 254 patients. There were uh, no conversions in 84% of patients. Uh, uh, it is really the patients who had minimally invasive surgery, of course, had uh, longer procedures, but less blood loss, shorter hospital stay, fewer 30-day uh, complications, and actually uh, fewer 30-day readmissions. So these data are showing us that, you know, at least in a feasibility approach, this looks like something we should look at. Um, because when we look at outcomes, look at this, there does not look like there's any difference in R0 or optimal side reduction between minimally invasive surgery and robotic approaches, and really no difference in outcomes for anything sort of that we look at, whether it's CFS or overall survival. Now, grantees are... Um, limited because they're single institution or, or, you know, dual institution studies, but certainly pave the way for us to look at this further. And especially this is important in this specific time as we're looking to really minimize our morbidity during this COVID era. Um, we at AAGL uh, partnered with eight other societies to release a joint statement on minimally invasive gynecologic surgery during this COVID um, pandemic really looking at the issues of, you know, should we consider minimally invasive surgery uh, at all during the COVID uh, pandemic? Uh, and, and looking at these issues, we have to think about the urgency of surgical treatment, um, universal testing, um, PPE for operating room personnel, the surgical approach, um, what laparoscopic-assisted approaches to gynecologic, gynecologic surgery, as, um, as it applies to the COVID era. Same thing with vaginal and laparotomy um, and hysteroscopy and other procedures. And of course, what matters here for us in this conversation is how do these risks, when we talk about surgery, how do these risks apply uh, to our decision? Should we open everybody 
for primary debulking through a laparotomy, or should we consider neoadjuvant chemotherapy and subsequently either minimally invasive or laparotomy for their interval debulking? Well, when this, you know, we thought one perspective would be safety first, right? do no harm. So ours in terms of uh, uh, pneumoperitoneum and uh, ex potentially expands into the operating room. And so should we therefore study knowing mean patients would stay in the hospital a little longer, higher likelihood of pulmonary complications. We also took a perspective of, you know, is laparoscopy considered safe during this pandemic? And are to mitigate risk? Um, and there has been one study now, one case report uh, was just released last week in Annals of Surgery that shows that variants, uh, uh, COVID variants are actually present in the peritoneal fluid, perhaps even at a higher uh, concentration compared to respiratory secretions. But really, what it comes down to is a new set of rules. How do we consider all these risks and balance them to make the right decisions for our patients in terms of surgical decision making? And so I think the, the, the take home pearls when we think about these things, and, and this is, of course, what we'll talk about, you know, should we preoperatively test every survey that in our center and have recommended that? Um, and don't operate on COVID-positive patients. We uh, universal PPE for everybody in the OR, everybody, N95 masks, gowns, and double gloves, so that if anybody gets missed, you know, with a false negative in the COVID testing, the whole staff is covered, our most precious resource, right? Uh, equipment, we want to maintain low pressure, use a closed suction system with appropriate filtration that will fi filter out that virion and make absolutely certain that we don't have any pneumo release uh, with um, the desufflation. Uh, we're not taking people's heads off, but, uh, <laughs> and vaginal occlusion. And vacuum up the smoke plume within two centimeters of the source um, if we do laparotomy. And we wanna make sure that we maintain a, a, an aerosolized uh, COVID safe environment during intubation and extubation. And the other thing I think is, you know, it matters what region you're in. Um, do you have a high prevalence of COVID and what's your ICU bed or hospital bed availability? All those things play into the decisions that we're going to be making when we think about how we're going to manage our patients with ovarian um, this time. So, so that brings us to sort of the discussion of, of what do we do? So, Brad, let's start with you. How do you think that we should handle our patients with ovarian cancer when they come in? Yeah, um, this idea of doing interval debulking with minimally invasive surgery, I have not started doing it, but you, uh, I think you persuaded me. I, I, I really enjoy the robot. Most of the surgeries I do are robotic, but just not that particular surgery because ovarian cancer is so rare. I'm going to think about it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Changed my practice. Fantastic. I think I will say I think we need to study this, and this is really a call for a, a major trial. Uh, I mean, I mm -hmm. think that um, that we prove that it's safe and effective, but you know, this is the time to do it. Tom, well, how you know, about we you? Did that, we did that in endometrial cancer, right? We did lap two, so we did a randomized prospective endometrial cancer trial, and we changed the world. Joan Walker is the first author, so you're right; it would be nice. That's right. Yeah, so Tom, I, what are your I'm, thoughts? As, as you know, I'm a big laparoscopy fan, and, and I, I try to do everything I can minimally invasive. Uh, Lee, I, I feel that it benefits the patient. Doesn't always benefit me, but it benefits the patient a great deal. And um, in all honesty, I, I, I've done quite a few. Uh, I do think it would be better if we were collecting data on it uh, as a group because there's there's a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, in this group. So you, you can do three to four cycles and you see some of them hardly have any disease left. Um, and, and it's really mm -hmm. a very easy procedure to do minimally mm -hmm. invasively. And then others do have um, some significant disease, uh, including in the upper abdomen. Um, and then it becomes a bit more uh, trying in terms of what you're, what you're able to accomplish minimally invasively. My conversion rate's probably a little bit higher in this setting because I, I feel so 
it's such an important goal to try to get these patients down to R0. Um, but uh, maybe you, maybe both of you have convinced me tonight it's about the biology of the disease anyway. So. Well, but I can, I can envision just what you said, right? So you give three cycles of chemotherapy, you do a CAT scan. CAT scans are really, really, you know, amazing these days. High resolution. You look at it and you say, oh, wow, there's hardly anything there. That's a yeah. scope case. Yeah. I, 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 a robot for me, but I'm, yeah, I, I'm well, going to start doing no harm, And there's no harm either. Just stick, quickly That's sticking right. a scope and, and looking yeah. around and making that yeah. decision. As long as you don't go down the route of trying to get everything out for two and a half, three hours by the scope, then you open or you really have done a disservice to, to everybody, <laughs> including the bank account That's for right. the hospital. Julie, for, these, for this aerosolized precaution with intubation, we started to do 20 minutes after intubation or extubation. Everyone had to clear the room. And are you guys doing that now? We started to do it and then we didn't know and we're not doing it anymore. I don't know why we were doing it. So we I don't know why the, we what, ha what, what are you doing? We had the same exact thing, except our number was 14. So we, yeah. we stepped out of the room for 14. But, you know, same thing. Uh, we did it for several weeks. And now we're back to, to not having that happen because we are testing everyone and, and we yeah, are same. wearing N95s across the board. Yeah. So, so I, I have patient. Do you gown up for your pre-op patient? Because it's a that's an aerosolized uh, procedure too. So to be honest, I see patients in the OR now. I don't see them in the pre-op holding area until they're back in the in the OR, um, and then oh. I see them. Everybody uh, steps out intubation. Although now, of course, we're not required to do that. I haven't been gowning, but that's a really interesting. Yeah, I want to hear what you have to say, Tom. We have a special testing place. So they go to a special place, and they're people that go to work, gown up, and they test pre-op patients. And they're gowned all day. And 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 then they basically, you, you can't, if you're in the surgical sort of area, you can't come into, into contact with someone unless they have what we call the uh, coronavirus passport. Interesting. So what we've done is... Um fairly similar uh we were at 15 minutes uh but we we had a case yesterday a long story she just couldn't get a test she's blind there's some other extenuating circumstances zero symptoms normal temperature but they still treated her as um, uh, possible covid uh of low uh suspicion and and so they did the 20 minute so i don't know what that means but they did 20 minutes yesterday but going in and out um <laughs> So everyone else is getting tested. So that's yeah. changed the dynamic a little bit. And at the, about the last three weeks, we started testing all uh, procedures. So if you're getting a procedure, uh, you're mm -hmm. getting tested. And so that has minimized the run on uh, N95s. It's minimized the concern. Now, could someone get it in between? I, I guess they could and be asymptomatic carrier in that 24, 36 hours, uh, potentially. Um, but that's what's going on in Cincinnati. We're testing, and uh, I do see them in the pre-op area then if they're COVID negative, and mm -hmm. much as a normal uh, surgery. Yeah, last week they they needed my room for a uh, for a trauma case, and um, they so obviously that patient wasn't tested, and they ultraviolet lighted the entire room after it, and it like took two hours, and it screwed up my whole day. Yeah, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> What, it what is about interesting surgery? how all of our practices become kind of standard. Right. Yeah. Very Brad, what, what about surgery in the uh, second line? Yeah, let's talk about that. So uh, thank you. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Rob Coleman. As you know, Rob Coleman has now uh, left MD Anderson. Um, uh, he, he's used the word retire. I hate to say that because he's not retiring. He's my age. Who would ever retire at, at our age? Um, and so this is a, a deck that we've worked on together. It will continue to evolve. Um, so it's about precision medicine when biology cuts deeper than the knife, right? So that, that's a lot of fun. And, you know, we have these sort of classic approaches. Um, this is the way birds see the world, right? So Desai always said, who's one of my mentors, 
that when you're a hammer, all the world's a nail. And so I, I really think that we need to sort of readjust our approaches to patient care. Uh, it, it is a personalized approach. I, I just set it for interval bulking. I'm going to do a CAT scan after three cycles because I just learned from Dr. Brown. And, and, and then I'm going to personalize the interval debulking approach between a minimally invasive to an open surgery. Um, so I really talked about the ovarian cancer statistics. Um, the, the numbers are falling. And although the incidence is falling, the prevalence is increasing. So with this increasing prevalence, patients are asking me and asking you, sh since you told me how important it was to have a primary operation, should I have another operation now that I have recurrent cancer? And again, it's, it, it's all about biology. Patients, again, are living longer. They're living longer because of the doctors, the perioperative, uh, we just talked about it, the multidisciplinary teams, but most importantly, effective systemic therapy. And that's what I was trying to illustrate, uh, uh, that, that, that it's a broad sort of biological assault. It's not a new type of laser. The other thing that, that I try to teach people is that when you do an operation, uh, you change the soil. So you create a cytokine storm. In fact, that's what happens in COVID, right? It's not the virus that kills you. It's the cytokine storm that kills you. So you, when you do an operation, you create a pro-angiogenic, pro-inflammatory process that may actually hurt the patient. And, and, and again, this is sort of something that, that, that I've thought about for a long time. It's all about tropism. It's all about sort of how this cancer spreads and what we do to promote spreading. So actually a surgery could hurt a patient, right? It's not one size fits all, okay? And, and again, this is an evolving sort of concept. Uh, I, I was able to find four papers in the New England Journal uh, that addressed surgery, and, and you've already talked about one of them, Tom. They're all negative. And it, and it may just be circumstance, but you know this is the first clinical trial that I was involved in, uh, 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 2004. Uh, this was a trial where, listen, why? You know, how could surgery be bad or not be effective? So we did it. And in fact, this is GOG 152 published it in the New England Journal, and you can see that this interval debulking operation did not help. Okay. So, so this was really no surgery versus surgery. It's the only study that we have. So patients had one operation, they didn't get the cancer out, so they tried again after three cycles. So this is no surgery versus surgery, and there was no difference, okay? I just put this in here historically, Tom, you showed this, but this was the second study that showed that, 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 that there was no benefit in that sort of uh, set, setting. And then the Germans did the Lyon study. You probably saw it last year. There's cancer in the lymph nodes, no question. So it must be good to take the lymph nodes out, right? If that's all that's left is the cancer remaining in the lymph node. I get it, it's microscopic disease. They randomized patients, 640 patients. No way. A third study where surgery really was not impactful, okay? So I, I think there's a theme here, uh, and, and certainly this is the most influential study, now number four, uh, a study that most of us on this, on this call did. Uh, I wanna uh, call you out, Tom. This is a study that, that you helped design. Uh, here you are uh, uh, on the author stream, and congratulations. This was really important. It was a two sort of pronged approach. It had a chemotherapy phase, platinum sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer, carboplatin paclitaxel with or without bevacizumab, and then a secondary cytoreduction surgery. So, this is the only uh, bevacizumab study that showed an overall survival advantage. It's a big study, almost 700 patients showed a five-month improvement in overall survival. That, that's pretty exciting. It led to an FDA approval. And again, Tom and Rob and all of you on, on, the, on the WebEx, congratulations. It also had a secondary endpoint uh, published in the New England Journal that showed that the patients that did not have an operation did, did better. How's that possible, right? So when I looked at this, my first response was, I told you so, Rob. I told you so, brother. And, and there was not even a difference in progression-free survival. To me, that was not surprising. And so I'm, I, when we were hit, sitting here talking about the COVID virus, I'm more than happy to get on my soapbox 
and say that a second operation is not helpful. And, 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 and all of us in our practices see patients that have it done. I don't know why, okay? So here's, maybe this is the reason why is that people say, look, I got an R0. I completely resected the tumor, and she did so well compared to the non-R0. And, and, and at the discussion to this, I won't tell you who it was because I don't want to offend anyone, but that's what happened at the discussion when this was presented at ASCO. They said, look, the R0 progression-free survival on the left, overall survival on the right, if, if the R0s live longer, it must be because I did something. No, it's the biology. That's the theme of this short presentation. So if you look at sort of the uh, 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 exploratory situation, uh, you say, well, uh, no surgery uh, versus R0. Look how, look how well the R0 patient did in progression-free survival. But when you do no surgery versus R0, they're the same. Okay? So, so there, is, there is level one evidence here that a second debulking operation isn't better. You say, well, the R0s do better. Yes, but that's because the R0s had a different biology. That's the key point. And then people say, come on, Monk, you tell us all the time it takes two trials to convince anyone of anything. Okay, I, 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 do, I have said that. Juji 218, Icon 7, right? Prima, Paola, two studies. So the Germans now have a study, it's called Desktop, Descriptive Evaluation, preoperative selection criteria of operability. So they have done three of these studies and, and, and they were able to identify uh, factors that predict R0. So performance status zero, residual disease zero at initial surgery and no ascites. So this, this will be presented here uh, at ASCO. I'm not gonna tell you the results but even if this study is positive and you go and operate on a platinum sensitive patient, fine, who's had two lines of therapy, not relevant here. There's only one line of therapy. If you operate on a patient for secondary solder reduction and then they had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, wrong. That wasn't eligible here. If you operate on a patient that has some ascites, wrong. That wasn't relevant here. So if you do sort of a consort diagram and exclude all the neoadjuvants and all the patients that have gross residual disease, maybe not, hopefully it's not very many, a primary debulking, and the ascites, the number of patients, even if desktop three is positive, even if desktop three is positive, it doesn't really prove anything because most of the patients would have, that you see or I see in the clinic have either had two lines of therapy or did not have R0 with their initial operation, or have ascites, or are not PS0. And in fact, we sort of know the demographics of desktop three, and almost 90% of the patients had a progression-free survival of more than 12 months. So I, I know you guys are excited to see this result at ASCO, and so am I. It's not gonna change my practice. 213 changed my practice, and even if this shows that there is a benefit to secondary solder reduction, the patient population is so restricted that it's not broadly applicable. And so I would hope that we as a group hold each other accountable. Um, you know, we changed the world very quickly with one study, by the way, that, oh, minimally invasive radical hysterectomy for cervical cancer was a bad idea. One study, remember I told you it takes two, but you guys immediately oh, you know, we're going to open our patients with cervical cancer, and we're going to write this big, long note that I counseled the patient about the LAC trial because, I, you know, I don't want to do the wrong thing. And then the next day you go and do a secondary solder reduction and don't mention 213 in the note. So I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just trying to sort of teach accountability and fairness. So um, I'm going to stop there. We have more than enough time for uh, discussion. I really want to hear Jubilee, and I, again, it, 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 it's, it's one of these really polarizing things, secondary to bulking. It, it, it's weird how, you know, laparoscopic radical hysterectomy really wasn't. Um, in, in your group, let's talk about your group, because I really don't really need to know what you do individually, but in your practice, Tom, in Cincinnati, did, did 213, I get it, you're a co-author, did that, you know, decrease the amount of secondary side reduction that you were seeing? It did. Um, 
Now, what's going to be interesting is if, as you said, there's a variance between the OS. And, and PFS, Brad, you know, is just not a fair surrogate endpoint when you're t removing the target lesion <laughs> and, know, right? and then saying that the PFS is better. <laughs> so the PFS is really uh, a bit of a distractor, frankly, in a surgical study when, P when you're using it as an endpoint. So you really mm -hmm. do need to look at other endpoints, and OS is... Uh, a perfectly great endpoint to use. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, I, I think you guys have convinced me it's about the biology of the tumor in the front line. Maybe it is here too, um, because there are some subtle differences between these trials. And, and, and we impact biology with intervention, right? Yep. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna do a uh, secondary side of reduction, Contrary to what 213 teaches, you at least give her bevacizumab to try to calm down the proangiogenic sort of milieu. Jubilee, what, uh, what, 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 tell, tell us what your opinions are of that. Yeah, so I think very similar. I think 213 did change how we practice. Um, you know, I, I almost feel like we have always looked for the right patient to do secondary cytoreductive surgery on. Um, but I do think it's about tumor biology. Most patients with ovarian cancer, you know, based on 213, I would not do a laparotomy for, um, for secondary cytoreductive surgery. That's, it's, and, and one of the reasons I think it's interesting in terms of tumor biology is that we know that that's the case for epithelial cancers, so high-grade serous ovarian cancers, but the tumor biology is very different say for stromal yeah. tumors, so granulosa cell tumors, you know, chemo is not as effective. So there, secondary cytoreduction does play a role. So, yeah. so again, I think just the tumor biology. Yeah, Dr. Janicek you know, just had a patient die that I rounded on. She had 20 operations for a stromal tumor over like 10 years. And I'm certain that he changed, changed her life, probably in a good way that she got 10 years of life. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah, I think, definitely. you know, the other question that we have to ask is, as we look at minimally invasive surgery, does it play a role for secondary cytoreductive surgery? And, you know, it may be that there are certain patients who don't necessarily need a laparotomy to remove related disease. And, and you know, perhaps we can intervene surgically without the, the sequelae of a big laparotomy. So, I know right. we don't have any data, data for interesting so for you guys uh, we're starting to get some questions uh and i shows how much i know so uh we had got a new rep for a medication uh that, that that we're using in our office i actually like the reps to stop by i think they add value uh the reps uh help you know deal with co-pays and authorizations and appeals uh in all sorts of different ways and so i really enjoy those interactions so somebody emailed me saying i'm your new rep i said come on by uh, and, and my, my nurse, who, who really is good to me, says, Monk, remember, uh, we're not seeing reps during the COVID. And then, you know, my sarcastic personality said, well, let's go have coffee together with, with uh, this particular person was a woman, you know, in the parking lot. <laughs> so, but, but are you guys seeing reps during this time? Maybe you never see reps. I don't know. No, we don't. We, in fact, we don't see reps. We don't have visitors. Um, we were chatting about that a little bit beforehand. We yeah. really restricted who can come in. It's really just patient unless there's an end of life discussion and then that's one person. Yeah, we saw reps prior to COVID and uh, since then we're on, a, the whole place is a fortress in terms of getting in. I mean, I feel really bad. I have to fight just to get a, a second person or a, a, a visitor, one visitor in with some people who would really benefit from having a support person there. Um, and, you know, and they'll say, well, she's, you know, not mentally disabled or whatever. I'm like, you know, speak, come on. So. Yeah, we uh, actually. It's difficult actually, right now for our reps. It's very yeah, difficult. Said, no medical students, no residents. And I didn't know he, he said no reps. Think of it if you're a rep. Think how, how tough that meant. I mean, the virus has affected so many people. Think if you work for one of these new approvals, right? You're so excited. Uh, you you so have all this and you can't yeah. go talk to your to your colleagues about it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You had a comment, Jubilee. Oh, I was just going to say, actually, I think that brings up the whole virtual platform. So um, I've actually, I, I had a patient today 
that chose to have a virtual visit with me so that her hus husband could be there with her when we talked because it wow. was important for her to have him next to her. And, you know, it just sort of speaks to change modalities. And, and even now, you know, look at what we're doing. We're doing a webinar, reaching a lot of people because that's how we can communicate now. And that may right. be true for learning from our reps as well. And Tom, you, here's another question. So you talked about interval cider reduction. As you recall, uh, there was that New England Journal paper that at that you know, interval cider reductive surgery between the third and the fourth cycles, there was an opportunity for HIPEC. Right. And maybe you were never using HIPEC, I don't know. But, but did, has that affected, or maybe you've heard others, that now they're not doing HIPEC anymore at that interval debulking operation? Yeah, I mean, we weren't doing it here. I, I certainly am intrigued by that paper, uh, obviously. Uh, it, it's hard to quite figure that out. A very modest gain in PFS, and yet over a year's difference in survival, overall overall survival. So I think that little bit came out of left field. But as you say, Brad, it takes two papers to, to really change people's minds. So I'm waiting on a second randomized paper, uh, and I'll have to take a closer look at that. But in terms of COVID, yeah. That's one of those things with likely, although that paper didn't show a lot of it, most other papers have shown more morbidity with the high pack. And, and so we tried to stay away from adding additional morbidity unless we had clear evidence of benefit. Right. So Jubilee, here's one for you. I, I noticed in your sort of case series about interdebulking that the patients were staying about three days in the hospital. Have you seen, and obviously, you know, ERAS, ERAS may be one of the greatest discoveries that we've ever done surgically. I mean, it, but, but, you know, we, my, my partners, I'm not quite that progressive. Heather Dalton is an example, you know, sends patients home from the recovery room uh, <laughs> after an endocrine <laughs> cancer operation. Yeah. And um, uh, good for her. Um, has the ERAS, was it already there or do you use more ERAS? Has it shortened the hospitalization? It's probably business as usual. Is that the idea? No, I think absolutely. ERAS. You know, ERAS, we adopted really just within about the last year and a half, and it's absolutely yeah. changed practice. Now, for minimally invasive surgery, I would say that we as a group, um, as well as individually, have gotten much better at shortening discharges because, you know, with anything that you adopt, you're going to be more conservative up front, make sure they do okay. And as you see that, they do so well. They go home, you know, sometimes the same day. They don't have to do much from the, similar to Dr. Dalton, uh, from the recovery room or, you know, usually the next now. So, uh, so it really has decreased our stay. The other thing that it made us do better, again, we were always trying, but the virus made us try harder, is palliative care. You know, we've all seen patients who are dying and they come to the hospital and that's ultimately when they go home on hospice. So again, that there's nothing productive about that. There never was. But but now in our attempt to keep patients out of the hospital and, and, and it'll be a long standing impact moving forward is that we now do home palliative care. And then ultimately when she decides to go on hospice, that process is already in place. So I, I, I can't think of a patient who was admitted sort of dying and then pivoted to hospice. We have a, a big palliative care service in our hospital. We're very proud of it. But that also went away, right? Has, what, 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 other, what other practice changes have you seen in your inpatient census? I mean, we don't have any patients in the hospital around anymore, hardly, because of ERAS. There's nobody in there that's dying. Um, what, what do you yeah. think? We, we still have a fair number of the failure to thrive. Um, you know, maybe it's because we haven't done a, a, an adequate job in terms of palliative care, but our palliative care people have been more virtual. We've ha we've had um, ancillary services have been suboptimal. They're, they're, they've just returned in the last week or two. But uh, up till then, trying to get physical therapy or anything else done for these patients that needed it, uh, was really difficult. So we're, we're getting the, you know, the, the sepsis from chemo, that type of patient. That's, that's our whole service. Uh, the surgeries go home very, very rapidly and they're motivated more so than ever with COVID. Right. They, they really are motivated to get out the same day, the next day. Um, I'm sending home even laparotomies on post-op day evening of one and uh, early on day two because they're so motivated to go. Mm -hmm. 
Well, this has been a great conversation. Um, we have two more to go. Uh, our next yeah. one is going to be about systemic therapy, uh, which is a key component of, of the patient experience with ovarian cancer. And then our fourth and final one will be about uh, vaccines and, and clinical trials. I'm going to, uh, uh, Jubilee and, and Dr. Herzog, I'm going to give you an opportunity for some final comments, and then we'll turn it over to the, to the moderator. So final, final comments. Great. I'll, I'll just say, you know, I think this is could not be more apropos for the current uh, state of affairs here. I think, you know, sometimes uh, it takes something terrible like the COVID to bring practice changes into focus. And I think that's what we're talking about tonight. So um, so I think, you know, onward and upward and uh, we'll see where we go from here. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hope everyone joins us next week. I, I think that's going to be a really exciting discussion. I think it's been a little bit of a journey. We talked about testing last week, we talked about the implications in surgery this week. Next week's going to be how do we treat these patients and, and what, what are all the new things we have out there? And then how does that change in the context of COVID? So I, th I think that'll be uh, really exciting. Um, so I hope everyone joins us. Great, thank you everyone. I just wanna thank everyone on our uh, panel for joining us and everyone for listening, thank you. Um, you will receive a link to listen back to this webinar uh, shortly following. Uh, in addition, as uh, our doctors mentioned, please tune in uh, next week for our talk on systemic therapies and um, please visit uh, www.unclive.com for all your oncology updates and information and to sign up for additional webinars. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you.